Well, it's a joy to be with you both this morning and across the weekend. I'm thankful for the trust uh, put in me by the elders and leaders of this church. And uh, to come and stand behind this pulpit is always a joy and an honor. Um, my affection for your pastor is mutual and um, appreciate his heart for God, his scholarship and his mind patterned after Christ. And uh, our friendship is a blessing and a gift from God. And, and uh, it's also good to come and renew fellowship with you and some from our church there in California that have moved here to the Dallas area. Big shout out to Seth and the team this morning, the orchestra, the choir. I don't know about you, did you enjoy that? Yeah. What, what a feast of music that allowed us to sing um, joyfully to the Lord and make a joyful noise uh, to shout to the Lord. It was a true blessing. Uh, when I was a young Christian, my father said to me, I think he heard it from someone else, he said, Philip, you want to treasure your faith like a Presbyterian, you want to share your faith like a Baptist, you want to organize your faith like a Methodist, and you want to enjoy your faith like a Pentecostal. And I think uh, Seth and the team allowed us to express ourselves a little bit and uh, just uh, bless the Lord with all of our soul and uh, to um, bless Him for all of His uh, benefits. Well, open uh, your Bible to um, the passage that Pastor Pennington read, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. We want to get going this morning, a lot of ground uh, to cover. Reminds me of the pastor who uh, opened his Bible and said to his congregation that he had a lot of ground to cover and he didn't know where to begin. And one of his deacons shouted out, why don't you begin near the end? Um, well, d don't do that to me this morning. Um, and, and we're not going to do that, but we're going to make a beginning and uh, we're going to work our way through this text. The message I've called, The Future Looks Good. That's been the theme of this past weekend, our living hope in the living Christ and His imminent soon glorious return. The future looks good, 1 Peter 1, 3 to 9. On one occasion, the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill was in a brief meeting with his counterpart from the Irish Republic. Both of them are facing some challenges within their own countries, and when Churchill remarked to the Irish Prime Minister that in his view, the situation in the United Kingdom was serious but not hopeless, the Irish P PM replied, well, in Ireland, the situation is um, hopeless but not serious. And um, not a great answer. Uh, I'll have to beg to differ. Uh, hopelessness is a serious matter. Hopelessness is a serious condition. Because what oxygen is to the body, hope is to the heart. Expectation is to the spirit. Take oxygen away from the body and death occurs through suffocation. Take hope from the heart and intellectual and spiritual paralysis sets in, accompanied by feelings of senselessness, purposelessness, and emptiness. Hopelessness is deadly serious. Hope is a necessary thing for our well-being. Take away hope and the soul shrivels. Take away hope and life dies. The great New Testament scholar D.A. Carson says this, hope looks into the future. It gives a reason for living. It makes actions and choices significant. It adds zest and focus, and it provides a moral compass. That's how important hope is to our human experience. It's the carrot on the stick, so to speak, that allows us to put one foot in front of the other, believing that the future is better than the past. It's hope that gets us up out of our bed. It's hope that drives us forward in the face of winds. It's hope that allows us to um, dig ourselves out of low moments. It is hope that allows us to hold on and wait for a better day. 
Proverbs 13, verse 12 says this, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when desire comes, when the dream is fulfilled, when what you expect happens, it's a tree of life. That's how important hope is. Without it, we're sick. With it, we have life. I like the story of the, the man who was one of, on one of those seven-day cruises, and uh, he had uh, sat down in the banqueting hall and enjoyed the buffet and, and, and uh, had kind of uh, overdid it, and the, the boat was rocking quite badly, and so he started to feel very nauseous. And so he went out onto the deck to get some fresh air, started leaning over the reel, thinking that, you know what, this isn't going to be good. And he just didn't look good, didn't feel good. And as he hung over the reel, one of the crew came by and said, sir, I assume you're seasick, but I want you to know I've sailed the seven seas. I've been a sailor for several decades. I've never known anyone to die of seasickness. The man looked at him and said, don't tell me that. It's the hope of dying that's keeping me alive. (laughs) And I, I think we can identify with that, right? Hope keeps us alive. It keeps us kicking and advancing. And with that in mind, I want to come to this wonderful passage in God's holy, inerrant, sufficient Word and remind you that the good news in the gospel is that Christians have hope in spades. That um, hope is the preserve of the Christian man and the Christian woman. Christianity has cornered the market on hope. Look at, look at this text here in verse 3, written by one of the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to this abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a living hope. Because Christ is alive and well, because Christ is risen and returning, we can always be hopeful. Amen. We, we are always pregnant with expectation. I love Proverbs 4, 18, the path of the just is as the sun that shines brighter until the perfect day. The path of the just grows brighter and brighter and brighter. Maybe think about 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. We go from one stage of glory to another stage of glory. One stage of hope to another stage of hope. That is what we enjoy in the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in Hebrews 7, verse 16, that Christ lives in an endless life. And if you and I are tied to Him, united to Him by faith through grace, then you and I have unending hope because our hope is tied to someone that has endless life. Our future is as bright as the promises of God. Amen? We live in a world, don't we? You see it. You may have even been going through it yourself right now. We live in a world of dying dreams and fading hopes. But the Christian is buoyed by a living, breathing, never dying hope founded on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So let's come and uh, work our way through these verses. Let's expound the text. But before we do that, let's put the text in its context. We're kind of parachuting in uh, for a one-off sermon this morning. We need to find our bearings. So the author is Peter, as the letter states. The date is probably about late 64, early 65. From what we can tell from the context, the saints here were going through a time of suffering, mostly soft persecution, but they're about to enter into a phase of persecution under Nero that will turn that soft persecution of, of um, being mocked and ostracized into hard persecution where some of them may lose their life for the sake of the gospel. Suffering is a theme throughout this letter. And if you read through its chapters, Peter will talk about various trials and fiery trials in chapter 1 and 4. He'll talk about harsh masters and bosses in chapter 2. He'll talk about unbelieving spices who don't obey God's Word in chapter 3. He'll talk about surrounding neighbors who slander Christians and a threatening culture that's kind of closing in. And in the middle of that, he writes to encourage them. In fact, the key to this book is 
found hanging on the back door. Uh, Peter tells us that he wrote this letter to exhort and testify that the true grace of God is theirs and they need to stand in it. He wants them to stand and survive and thrive through darkening days. He wants to encourage them, revive their hope, call them to courage and steadfastness. He wants this letter to be a bottle of smelling salts to revive their flagging spirits and their discouraged hearts. And one of the ways he's going to do it, he's going to fix them on coming glory. He's going to fix their hope on the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the past, which uh, uh, pretends for the coming of Jesus Christ in the future. And you'll get this theme of suffering followed by glory. Suffering followed by glory. They're suffering, but he wants them to know it's going to be followed by glory. So let that be the carrot on the stick that allows you to put one foot in front of the other, to keep going along the path of suffering, to take to the road of Christian discipleship. Let me show you that theme quickly. Look at chapter 1, verse 11. Speaking of those of old, we read that they testified of the Lord Jesus Christ beforehand of His suffering and the glory that would follow. We see the pattern of suffering and glory in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see humility and suffering followed by exaltation and glory. Isn't that the whole theme of Philippians 2 verses 1 through 11? And he keeps that theme going in chapter 4 verses 12 through um, 13, he says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you are partakers of Christ's suffering, and when His glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Suffering glory. It was true in Christ. It's true in them. Peter says it's been true in him. As a faithful elder, he says, I'm a fellow elder, chapter 5, verse 1, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. I just want you to get life in order. You're not going to enjoy your best life now regardless of what Joel Osteen says. It's suffering now. It's cross-bearing now. It's hardship now. It's losses now. Crosses now. Then crowns, glory, triumph. And so Paul, Peter wants them to get that. They're kind of, you know, sandwiched between the suffering and the coming glory. So here he writes to encourage them. There's three things I think he says about this everlasting hope, this coming glory. Number one, we have the ground of this hope. Number two, we have the guarantee of this hope. And number three, we have the gladness of this hope. So open your Bible, follow along, write some notes, and go home as good Bereans and see if these things are so. Let's look at the ground of this hope. Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. By what means? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The source of their positive outlook, the source of their expectation and anticipation was an empty tomb. Christ was risen. Christ was risen. This is one long sentence in the Greek, and it's an expression of doxology, and Peter is rejoicing that Christ has died, was buried, has risen again. He has killed death. He has paid for sin. He has triumphed over Satan. Christ is alive, which means hope lives on. So this is the ground of this hope. You see, God has given us new birth, which has produced new life, which gives us unending hope. By the way, did you notice how the Christian is described as one who has been born again or begotten, made alive? See, we're not born Christians. We've got to be born again to be Christians. Being an American doesn't make you a Christian. Repentance and faith towards Jesus Christ in a personal manner is what makes you a Christian. Jesus said in John 3, didn't he? Verse uh, um, 3 and 5, you must be born again if you mean to see God and enter His kingdom. You know, born again is not some special category of Christian. You know, the people who get really fanatical about their faith, well, they're the born-again types. 
No, there's only one type of Christian. The born again type of Christian. The person who has come to experience the life-giving work of Jesus Christ in their life premised upon a moment of repentance, an acknowledgement that God placed your sin upon His Son and Christ carried that sin away and in a gift from God Himself, you've been granted an imputed righteousness and acceptance of standing before God based on Christ's work testified in His resurrection. There has to be that moment when, like natural birth, you have a new birth. We used to say back in Northern Ireland, you've got to be born twice to die once. If you're only, if you're only born once, you'll die twice. There's a second death, and you want to escape it, which means you need a second birth, a new birth. Christianity isn't about you turning over a new leaf. Christianity is about you receiving a new life Amen. in the Lord Jesus Christ. John 5:34 where the moment you put your faith alone in Him, you pass from death unto life, and you will not come into judgment. So here we have this new birth, which produces new life, which brings with it new hope. You see, we were once in this world, right, without God and without hope. But now in Christ, we have abundant hope in all that it promises. Here's some of the things it promises quickly. It promises eternal life. Jesus' resurrection and your belief in it and in Him produces eternal life. John 11, 25 to 26, Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Wasn't it D.L. Moody who said, when you read in the Chicago newspaper someday that D.L. Moody is dead, don't believe it. Because at that moment, D.L. Moody will be more alive than he's ever been before. It promises justification to sinners. Romans 4, 23 to 25 says that Jesus Christ was raised for our justification. See, on the cross, He's paying for our sin. He's pouring out His soul unto death for us. He's tasting death for all men, and God accepts that on our behalf as we put our faith in Jesus Christ. And to testify to that reality, the finality of that work, the perfection of that work, God raised Him from the dead. Romans 4, 1 verse 4 says that He was declared to be God's Son by His resurrection. And in that sense, the resurrection reminds us that Christ has done that work which allows us to be declared righteous before God in an act of grace. Isn't that a marvelous thing? Promises us life in our mortal bodies, Romans 8 verse 11. Promises us that our service in Jesus Christ is worthwhile. At the end of that glorious chapter on resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, we're told what, therefore, in the light of an empty tomb, in the light of an enthroned Christ, in the light of a returning king, don't, don't you know, be, be, be always abounding in the work of the Lord and be steadfast and unmovable because it's not in vain. It's not in vain. We're not to be pitied. We're on the right road. We're living for those things that will rebound to our eternal happiness. We've got the promise of the destruction of death, right? 1 Corinthians 15, 54, 57. Someday as we're raptured, as we're resurrected, we'll look back on that grave of ours and say, oh, death, where is your sting? You couldn't hold me. You couldn't keep me. You couldn't do it with Christ, and you can't do it with me, because He's the first fruits of a far greater resurrection. Amen. When we read that, actually, we're being a little premature. We've got to wait to the resurrection and the rapture to say that, but that's the promise of the resurrection. Imperishable bodies, glory to come. That's our hope, and it's a living one. That's the thing I want to get to. It's a living hope. All of that is promised to us. All of that is ours. We're pregnant with that gospel reality, and it's living and abiding and continuing. Living actually is a word Peter likes to use. He talks about living hope and the living word and living stones. So the point is this. A believer's hope is sure, certain, real, as opposed to deceptive, empty, and false. You see, ours is a living hope grounded in a reality. 
anchored to an historic fact. This isn't wishing upon a star. This isn't a delusion. This is well-placed belief rooted in solid truth that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and then was buried and on the third day rose again according to the Scriptures. That's the solid truth. That's the reality. That's the attested fact. In fact, Peter is an eyewitness to that reality. You see, a Christian hope that looks forward is a Christian faith that looks back. We look back to the resurrection and all that it promises. We stand over that tomb and the stone has been rolled away and we look in and what do we see? We see living hope. We see endless expectation. You see, if Christ is alive and alive forevermore, and by the way, He is, that's not up for debate. Revelation 1, 17 to 18, remember how He encounters John, says, John, I'm alive forevermore. I was dead, but I'm alive. And I hold in my hands, I've got authority over death and hell. And if that's true, then our hope is alive. If our hope is tied to Jesus Christ, then our, our hope is only as, uh, as substantial and as lasting as He is, and He's alive forevermore. He has conquered death, which means you mustn't allow your hope to be conquered. You mustn't allow that hope to surrender to circumstances, give in to the accusations of the devil, or under the pressure of a Christ-rejecting world. Don't trade that hope in for a new hope, because this is a living, enduring hope. There's no expiration date. It's as good today as it was yesterday, and it'll be as good tomorrow as it is today. It's a wonderful thing. Our hope is connected to forever. Amen. Jesus Christ is alive forevermore. Christianity wasn't built in a coffin. I think it was Sidlow Baxter who said that. Christianity wasn't built on a coffin lid. The skull and the crossbones was never our insignia. Muhammad is dead. Buddha is dead. Hindu sages are dead. But Jesus is alive. Amen. And we've been, we have been born again unto a living hope through His resurrection. Paul Tripp in his marvelous book Forever said this, if you are a God's child, you have a hope because God is hope, and you have a hope that will last forever because He has defeated the one thing that stands between you and forever, death. See, the one thing that stands between you and forever is death, and Jesus Christ has conquered it. And you have been born again onto a living hope. Let me illustrate this. Um, I'm sure most of us have seen the movie Moby Dick. Maybe some of us have read the book. In fact, a man came up to me after first service and said he just finished it this week. It's a classic, written by Herman Melville. It tells the story of Captain Ahab, right? And his obsession about that white wheel that one day bit his leg off and he was determined to kill it and he chased it across the seas. He imperiled the life of his crew and his vessel in the pursuit of that. And in fact, the, the, the crew lose their lives, so does Ahab. The ship sinks, except for one man, Ishmael who actually tells the story. If you read Moby Dick, it, it, it's um, told by uh, this, this one man. How did he survive? Well, here's the story. During the voyage, one of the crew who was a friend of Ishmael has this premonition he's going to die. Just, just believes he won't see the end of this voyage, and so he has the carpenter on the ship build a coffin for him as he anticipates his demise. Well, they you know, they, they come in contact with Moby Dick, and, and uh, tragedy ensues. The ship sinks, the crew drowns. Captain Ahab is drawn under by the great wheel. But Ishmael survives, and he bobs up and down hopelessly on the sea until all of a sudden that coffin, which must have dislodged itself, it rises and pops up on the surface of the ocean. And Ishmael climbs into the open coffin and survives the storm, survives the sea, survives the sharks until a passing ship rescues him. Now, here's the interesting thing. Herman Melville was a Christian, and much of what he wrote had a morality to it and a Christian worldview to it, and his images are not accidental. The image of an empty coffin that saves Ishmael 
is not coincidental. And the application is that. It's an empty coffin that saves us. It's a risen Christ who died for our sins that brings hope to us as we bob up and down on life's ocean. And that's what Peter wants them to get. That, that, that hope through the empty coffin. That's the, the ground of this living hope, a risen living Savior. Now I look at the guarantee of this hope. The living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, if you'll notice in our text, is directed toward and fixed upon a heavenly inheritance. Verse 4, 2, this living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ has this as its object. It's directed to an inheritance. And notice this about the nature of the inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled. And notice this about the security of this inheritance. It won't fade away. It's reserved in heaven, and we are kept by the power of God who keeps the inheritance. Love it. That's why the future is looking good for us. It's always good for us because we've got a future that's reserved. It's there waiting for us to come and enjoy it and enter into it. What a message that must have been to persecuted Christians. As Peter writes, that they would stand in this grace in the hope of this glory. I think it was one of the old Puritans who said, it matters not to a rider if it's raining, if he is riding to be crowned. All right? Imagine a prince riding on a horse in the rain. It doesn't matter because he's riding to be crowned king. And that's the image. If it rains on you, if the wind is in your face, better days behind your back, it doesn't matter. You're, 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 you're going to be crowned. You have a living hope that, that is directed and fixed upon um, an inheritance that, that's undefiled and won't fade away and is reserved. Let's just unpack that a little bit. Let, let's look at the nature of this inheritance. Notice our, our hope is fixed on an inheritance. I think that's a significant word. It's well chosen, purposely selected by Peter. You'll find it throughout the LXX, which is the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, that it's used in Numbers 26, verse 54 and 56, Joshua 11, verse 23 of a God-given, grace-provided apportionment of territory to one of the twelve tribes of Israel. So in that sense, uh, uh, with, with the Old Testament as a background, the idea of inheritance in the Jewish community and in the history of God's dealings with Israel is land, territory, real estate. And you know what? I don't rule that out as part of our inheritance. That's what this whole weekend's been about. Whether we will go to heaven in the intermediate state, but our final destination is what? It's a new earth and a new heaven wherein dwells righteousness. Um, in Second Peter um, 3, Peter talks about the day of the Lord, talks about the coming wrath, he talks about the dissolution of all things as they presently are formed and, and constructed. And then he says this in verse 13, nevertheless, we according to this hope or this promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And you and I will reign with Christ, and I don't see why we can't extend this thought that in that millennial kingdom and then in the eternal state, you and I will be a portion, some real estate. Okay? I'm hoping for California without the loonies. That would be a nice, <laughs> that would be a nice present. I don't know if the Lord will give me that. But, but I don't want to rule out the idea of real estate, territory, land. But, but it's much more than that for the Christian. We've learned about this this weekend. I don't have time to go in this direction, but across this weekend, we've been reminded of what's entailed in our hope, right? Enjoying the presence of Christ forever, where there's pleasures forevermore in His right hand, eternal rest from our labors, our struggles in a heavenly home, the end of tears and trials, the destruction of death, the reunion with loved ones who have gone on before, the completion of our salvation in that final act of glorification. I have been saved, I am being saved, I will be saved. I have been justified, I am being sanctified, I will be glorified. 
The penalty of my sin is being covered and the power of sin is being diminished and someday I'll be removed from the presence of sin. That's what awaits us. The wonders of heaven, the Father's house, the glory of God, a resurrected body, treasure in heaven, reigning with Christ. That's our inheritance. Now, that should get you up in the morning, by the way. That should cause you to sing on a Sunday here with these great hymns which outline your inheritance. That's the nature of it. What about the quality of it? I don't have time to dig into the meaning of each word, and certainly each word has a an implication, maybe a, a, separ- a separate import, but I think this idea of it's incorruptible, it's undefiled, and it doesn't fade away, what, what is not to be missed is this fact that our inheritance can't be shorted, stolen, or spoiled. And you know what? If you do compare it to the inheritance uh, in the land of Israel uh, within redemptive history, that inheritance could be spoiled. That inheritance could be corrupted and devalued. Read the history of the nation of Israel. And and with plagues or famine or invading armies, their inheritance was defiled by pagan worship. The land was spoiled by famine. But you see, what we have, it's reserved. It won't be spoiled. It won't be tarnished. Sin cannot stain it. Satan cannot spoil it and time cannot steal it. There was one phrase that um, H.B. Charles said throughout this weekend that I just couldn't get by. Did you notice he said on several occasions that, that, that you know, that, that which is of lasting character is of greatest value? My friend, you and I have an inheritance of lasting character and quality. And for us, it should be something we treasure and rejoice in and appreciate. We should be counting our spiritual pennies every day. I have an inheritance. We should be opening our spiritual bank book every day and reminding ourselves of what we have in Jesus Christ. And, and you have the nature of it, and you have the quality of it, and you have the security of it. It's reserved in heaven. Our future is reserved in heaven. All that we have in Jesus Christ is being protected it's kept, it's shielded, it's protected, it's guarded. In fact, this word um, kept or guarded is, is, is a military term of, of a garrison of soldiers that take care of a city. God is watching over our inheritance. This great and exceeding promise that is ours is being reserved and preserved for us. God is keeping the inheritance which is the promise of the fruit and benefits of the resurrection and the atoning work of Jesus Christ. God is keeping that for us, and He's keeping us for it. And He's keeping us through the stages of His work of salvation in us. The believer is safe, and his inheritance is safe. I mean, verses that just underscore that or maybe echo some of that would be, remember what Jesus said back in John 10, uh, 28 to, to 30, and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father has given them to me as greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Jesus talks about in, my, in Matthew 6, 19 to 20, about we have treasure in heaven where moth and dust don't corrupt and thieves don't break in and steal. Similar language, isn't it? What about um, Romans 8, 31 to 39? Nothing will separate us from the love of God. It's ours. We're, it, uh, those who are kept by the power of God have a hope that is living and lasting and an inheritance that can't be lost. The best thing in the world is being saved, right? Amen. Wrong. Well, not really. Right and wrong. A little trick question. I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> the best thing in the world is being saved. That's right. But, but wrong in the sense, something better than that. The best thing in the world is being saved and knowing that you're saved. But that's not stopped there. The best thing in the world is not only being saved, knowing that you're saved, but knowing that you can never lose it. 
God is keeping you for what He's keeping you for. Beautiful. No one will pluck you out of His hand. You know what? People will disappoint you. Things will disappoint you. You will disappoint you. Governments will disappoint you. Come over and live on the West Coast. (laughs) Churches will disappoint you. Most of the things that we put our hope in don't deliver. They fade with time. They're spoiled by human touch. Most of the time, you and I are just around the corner from having our hopes dashed and our dreams stolen. Nothing seems certain. Nothing seems sure. But Peter wants you to know, hold on a minute. You have an inheritance that's sure. It's kept, reserved. All that is yours in Jesus Christ is locked away in God's vault. And it's kept for you. No one can rob you of God's love, God's mercy, God's grace. No one can take away His indwelling presence by the Holy Spirit, for you're sealed on the day of redemption. The peace that passes all our understanding is yours. The joy that's unspeakable is yours. Let me illustrate this quickly, mindful of time. But it's a great illustration. A Ruth Bell, Ruth um, Graham Lutz, the daughter of Billy Graham, a writer, a woman speaker, um, she tells a story in her book on Genesis about um, it was the end of school and, and summer was coming. And so at the end of the last day of school, she took her children out downtown for some ice cream to celebrate school was over. Summer had come. And um, while they were away, their house was robbed. They return, the doors open, windows are broken, um, antiques are stolen, jewelry's gone, money where it could be found uh, was, was pilfered. And it was, it was heartbreaking. Maybe some of you have experienced that. It just does something to your psyche. And she was working her way through that. And, and the police told her, you know what, given the nature of this, the professionalism of this, she said, they, they've been staking this home for a while. So she lies down. I'll let her speak for herself. It's late in the night now. She's kind of just getting past. The kids are in bed. Police are gone. She settles down. Here's what she says. That night, I crawled into my bed, the same bed that the thieves had so neatly turned back so that they could take the pillowcases off the pillows to use as sacks to take the stuff away. Can you imagine? And she says, as I, as I lay there in the darkness, I began thinking about what the police had said. They really, that couldn't have been stopped. There's nothing that could have been done. And she started thinking about that. Well, that means, you know what? Where's the security? Things can be taken from me. And she said, you know what? My health could be robbed by illness, my education, by advanced knowledge. My house could burn to the ground. My children could leave home. My husband could drop dead with a heart attack. My youth could be robbed by old age, my reputation robbed by gossip. She started thinking about all the other stuff that could be stolen, taken, removed. And in the middle of that little crisis she was going through, she says, but hold on a minute. And God, the Spirit spoke the word to her comfort. said, but hold on, you have an inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven. And she began mulling over the gospel and the benefits of the blood and the glories of God's grace in her life. And she got up that morning, sat at a kitchen table, got a piece of paper, wrote down the alphabet, and started working through the alphabet. I am accepted by God, beloved by God, chosen by God, delivered by God, enlightened by God, forgiven by God. G, I've got the grace of God. E, it's the hope for the future. I, inheritance in heaven. J, justification. K, knowledge. L, love. M, mercy. N, nearness. One, O, oneness with God. P, peace. And all she went, right to the end. If you want to know what you did with Zed, you can find out for yourself. Um, but, but here's the issue. Can you, um, can you imagine how good that was? That brought a joy and a peace to her life. In fact, that takes us to our last thought, the gladness of this hope. Because Ruth Graham Lutz was doing what Peter says here in 1 Peter, which he encourages them to do. Verse 6, in this or in these truths, you rejoice. Though for a little while, if need be, you're going to be grieved and hurt by various trials. Let's look at this gladness. We've looked at the ground of this hope, 
the guarantee. Let's look at the gladness for whatever time that remains. And, and joy is a theme that, that Peter um, picks up. He'll scroll down to verse 8. Christ we haven't seen, but we love Him. And yet believing, we rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. A glorious joy. That simply means that the joy that you and I find is linked to Christ's return in glory. And all the benefits that spill over to our eternal happiness. That's where we find our joy. It's a glorious joy tied to the return of Jesus Christ in glory and our going to glory. He picks up that theme again in, in verse um, 13 of chapter 4. But rejoice to the extent that you participate in Christ's sufferings. When His glory is revealed, you'll be exceedingly happy. So through sorrowful times, they find a joy, a present joy latched to a future hope. See, that future hope that unfading inheritance, that return of Jesus Christ from the right hand of God with the armies of heaven, that's give them a joy in the present that helped them deal with the sorrows that surrounded them. Do you see the connection? A present joy that knows our souls are safe. A present joy that knows that death has been conquered. A present joy that anticipates the end of their faith. This was a, a joy that was inexpressible, full of glory, and one that needed to be activated by faith actively. Peter puts the onus on them, in this you must greatly rejoice, or in this you must rejoice, or in this is where you'll find your joy. In these truths, thought about, meditated upon, assimilated, that's what will bring the joy. As you preach the gospel to yourself, as you remind yourself at the Lord's table until He come, as you read the prophetic scriptures and remind yourself of the blessed hope of His glorious appearing, as you rejoice actively in that, read, meditate, mull over, anticipate, bring to your mind every day like Lord Shaftesbury did, that's going to affect you. It's going to make you bold, but it's going to make you happy. And so this present joy centered on a future hope enables them to deal with momentary trials. Uh, that's a theme Paul picks up, right, in Romans 8, 18. This present suffering is not to be compared with the glory that's coming. Their eschatological hope fitted them for uncertain times. Prophecy is practical. Eschatology is ethical. And so, he talks about their trials. Let me squeeze these thoughts in towards the end here. They could rejoice because their trials were passing. A little while, and Jesus is going to come, and these various trials are going to pass. Verse 6, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you're grieved. He wants them to remind themselves, and so must you, my trial is temporary. My suffering is passing. I will weep for a night, but joy will come everlastingly in a morning. I'm suffering, and there's coming glory. I'm bearing a cross. Someday I'll wear a crown. Now, I want to say this. This idea of a, of a little while, we've got to be careful with that, because suffering for some of God's saints can be large and long. There are brothers and sisters right now who hardly see the daylight in prison camps in North Korea. There are Christians who have suffered disability over a lifetime. There are brothers and sisters in parts of the world where their faith is constantly being challenged. There's nothing small or little or short about it. It's every single day. It's, it's the cloud they live under. So, but you see, Peter's not talking about little in that sense. He's talking about it's little, it's short, it's passing when set against eternity. Now, your suffering may be long from an earthly perspective, but it is short from an eternal perspective, and you've got to keep that perspective. 
You've got to peek beyond the horizon of the moment and madness you're in. And remember, there's an eternal day dawning when He will wipe away every tear. Spurgeon kind of gives us something to think about. He, he kind of draws this analogy when he traveled to Europe. He calls it the continent. He would sometimes end up in a, a hotel or somewhere to stay that wasn't up to, you know, snuff, so to speak. A little crowded. The food wasn't great. You know, whatever the case. They might have been a little disappointed in it, but he would rally himself and he would rouse himself and those who were with him and he'd say this, what does it matter? It's only for one night. We're off in the morning. And then he says this, so as we are soon to be gone as Christians and the time of our departure is imminent as believers, let us not be ruffling our tempers about trifles. Remember that the next time you put the news on, please. Nor raise evil spirits around us by finding fault. Take things as you find them, for we shall soon be up and gone. That's Peter's point. Passing, purifying. These trials are purifying. Did you notice that? For this, in this you need to greatly rejoice. In these truths, you need to find your joy, though nigh for a little while set against eternity. If need be, you'll be grieved. But know that these trials have been sent for this purpose, that the genuineness of your faith being much more more precious than gold, that perishes, though it be tested by far, may be found praiseworthy and honorable. So the, the trials are passing, but the trials are purifying. Let me um, just deal with this ever so briefly, but, but Peter has his, um, in the uh, smelting pot, uh, so to speak, uh, the refining process that um, the jeweler works when he's working to um, check the quality of gold. And you know that often the metal would be melted down to liquid form, heated up so that the impurities and the dross would surface and then that would be skimmed off and the gold would be purified and tested. In fact, I'm told in, in some uh, uh, cultures that, that the goldsmith, as he took the, the impurities away and the dross was removed, he was waiting to see his reflection in the gold. That would tell him that it had been proven and purified. The old preachers used to say, you know what? God puts us through trials and troubles and turns the heat up until the beauty and character of Jesus Christ forms in us and is manifest through our trials. And that's the point here, that you and I are put through trials so that our faith is tested, so that when Jesus returns, our faith is authentic and real and a testimony to the glory of His grace at work in our lives. Young man wanted to grow some peaches. He wanted to be a peach farmer, and so he saved up a ton of money and bought his own orchard. He was so excited about this future that was beckoning. And his first crop was spoiled by frost. Lost it all. Now he's on the skids and in trouble. He goes to his pastor and he says this, I'm done with God. Do you think that I want to worship a God who cares for me so little that He will let a frost kill my peaches? The old pastor was wise enough to just listen, settled things down a bit, and then he said this, God does love you more than you appreciate, and He loves you more than your peaches. He knows that while peaches do better without frost, it's impossible to grow the best men without frost. His object is to grow men not peaches. And I bring that perspective to whatever loss you're going through that's bothering you and maybe has tempting you to question the goodness of God. My friend, God's more interested in growing you than your business. God's more interested in your eternal well-being than your physical health. God's more interested in your eternal joy than your present happiness. Just, just understand that your faith is being tested and purified so that when Jesus comes, which is our hope, we may be found, did you notice? To praise and honor and glory, which is our last and closing thought. The trials are passing, and the trials are purifying, and the trials are profitable. 
God's getting us ready for that great crowning day, the coming glory. And so the results is purifying. That's, you know, uh, Steve dealt with that. Anyone that has this hope purifies himself, even as Christ is pure. Christ is pure. Christ is holy. And He's returning to collect the people that are pure and holy and made more pure and holy in the glorification stage of salvation. So when Jesus comes as we close, we want Him to find us godly, growing, and genuine. Did you notice, by the way, the focus here isn't on the glory that Christ will receive, but the glory that you will receive? That's a little counterintuitive, because the emphasis of Scripture, rightly so, is on the glory He will receive. If the world had known it, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. And He's going to come back in glory, and every knee will bow and every tongue confess. But here's a beautiful thought. At the rapture and following the rapture, the judgment seat of Christ, as your life is looked into, hopefully you'll pass that fire also, that test also, and your works will remain, works of gold and silver and precious stones. And then according to 1 Corinthians 4 verse 5, you will receive your praise. I want, to, I want some praise from God. If I can put it that way, it almost sounds blasphemous, because my, my purpose in life is to glorify Him. That's the cheap end of man. But you know what? God's going to praise us. It, it says in Zephaniah 3 verse 17 that He will stand over and, and, and find joy in His people. You want that well done and good and faithful servant. You want to embrace the suffering now in the light of the coming glory. You want your faith to be genuine so that when Jesus returns, reward and life to come and blessing are yours in abundance. Isn't it Peter that talks about in 2 Peter 1, that abundant entrance into the kingdom? I want an abundant entrance into the kingdom. Let me finish with this as the team gets ready to bring this to a close. British leader Calvin Reed um, tells the story of a young man in his congregation who had fallen down the stairs as a baby, shattered his back, and so in a lifetime of suffering and disability ensued. He was in and out of hospitals his whole life. And one night, Calvin Reed interviewed this young boy. He, by this stage, he's 17. And he asked him, um, you know what, how many years have you spent in hospital? And the young man said, 13. In and out of hospital, 13 years. In a 17-year span, can you imagine? And then he follows up and he says this, have you ever asked God the question of fairness? Young boy replies classically, says, well, God has got all of eternity to make it up to me. And he will. That's been the beauty of this weekend as we have learned about the inheritance that is reserved in heaven for us. When God will exchange our cross for a crown and our tears for joy and our suffering for glory and our struggles for triumph. Amen? Let that be this carrot on the stick that keeps you putting one foot in front of another. Father, we pray that this passage will have been a bottle of smelling salts reviving us. Our flagging spirits, our discouraged hearts. Life isn't easy and the Christian life on top of that makes it doubly hard. But we thank you that you've given us hope. You've given us incentive. You've you put a carrot on the end of the stick telling us to keep moving forward for glory awaits, an imperishable body, uh, unspeakable joy, rest from our labors, the presence of God and pleasures forevermore. It's all ours. And I pray that we will not allow the world to kill it. I pray that we will not allow guilt and sin to kill it. I pray that we will not allow Satan to rob us of it, but that we would indeed Rejoice in these truths. 
so that indeed we would rejoice with joy unspeakable even in the midst of our sorrow because we know our sorrows and our trials are passing and they're profitable and they're purifying. So, Lord, we thank you. Christ is our hope in life and death. And we thank you for this weekend. May its sanctifying influence continue to influence us. May we hide your word in our heart that we may not sin against you. And we pray it all and ask it all and plead it all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.